Hello and good morning, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Alexa and Friends. Today, I have Julia Hirschberg here with me. She is a Amazon scholar and a computer science professor at Columbia University. Julia, thank you so much for being here today. I'm very happy to be talking to you, Jeff. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So one of the things that uh, I know you and I chatted about very briefly, uh, but that I like to do at the beginning of these interviews, yes. is to ask a couple of silly questions. All right. And so with that, I'm going to get right into that. The first question that I often ask is, um, with uh, the last 10 or 15 years or so, we've had a lot of superhero movies come out. Um, and one of the things I'm always interested to know about people is if you could pick any superpower for yourself, what would you pick? And then I'd love your story on what your reasoning is. Why did you pick that one specifically? Okay, so I know that you asked this question because I watched a couple of these. And at first I thought, well, the superpower I want, I thought, was to be able to see what's in people's minds, other people. All right. But then I realized I'd rather, be, given that I've been home or working from home for a long time and I have some pets, I'd really like to know what my cats are thinking because they're completely <laughs> I'm yeah. really hard to detect. So yeah. either one of these or possibly both. That's interesting. So one of the, <clears throat> you are not the first person to say that they want to be able to telepathy, be able to read minds, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, but the one thing that always scares about me, scares me about that is that you get to know everything someone or something in the case of an animal's thinking. Um, but that also means you get to know everything that they're thinking. And sometimes that can be a curse. I think. I think easier with animals possibly than with people. <laughs> right. Some people I do not want to read their minds. <laughs> right. Uh, I agree. So we have a couple of people in the chat that are questioning whether or not this is live or pre-recorded. This is both live. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm glad that you're here, Julie. Okay, second question. Uh, this one requires a little storytelling for those that haven't heard this story before. I want you to imagine you're in a large congested city and you're walking to visit some friends for lunch. Okay. Uh, you're on 17th Street. You need to get to 18th Street. And... Um, as you uh, as you start to head over there, you realize you have to walk all the way around this big city block where there's this really nice, open, brightly lit alley that you could walk down that would get you directly to the restaurant that you're meeting. Oh, uh -huh. So you head halfway down this alley, uh, only to realize that at the end that they were heading towards emerges this huge horse-sized duck right in front of you. Uh, it does not look friendly. It does not look like someone that you're, you're going to be uh, pals with. So you decide to turn around like any smart human would, and you decide to head the other direction, make the long walk, uh, only to realize that end has been closed by 100 duck-sized horses, very small horses. <laughs> so in either case, you're probably going to have a little bit of a scuffle, uh, maybe just to try to escape or whatever. Uh, but I'm always curious to know, um, where, which end would you head towards? Which one do you feel like you'd have more success at? I'd go to the duck because now I know how to read the duck's mind. <laughs> I know what it's thinking about, right? Ooh, I like that. Actually, I like ducks. I like horses too, but I've always liked ducks. Um, when I was working at Bell Labs, we had, well, there were a lot of geese, but they look like ducks sure. uh, out around in the um, surrounding uh, countryside. And it was really nice. Just yeah. beautiful. So anyway, yeah. yeah, I like ducks and I, don't think they're unfriendly. No, no, no. Mo for the most part, they're not, unless you get near their nest or something like that. Yes. Uh, did you grow up around horses? N well, actually, my sister loves horses, so I grew up around her horses. But, uh, yeah, she had horses, and she still has horses. Now she has older horses that she's trying to keep alive, and some of them live to be 30. So she wow. has a farm, and it's really great. Yeah, that's, that's a commitment. I, uh, I've seen some stories recently about how um, people that have a pet tortoise, right? Tortoises live forever mm -hmm. um, and how they've been passed down from generation to generation. Oh. They, have, they have a tortoise that was around during the civil war. Oh my God. That's <laughs> amazing. That is amazing. Yeah. I don't know about those. Uh, all right. Well, I, I want to hear about your career history. Um, you've, mm -hmm. you've had a, a quite a path that, that you've led. Um, but before that, uh, mm -hmm. I want to add one more little tidbit to this, which is okay. I was just, uh, I was just talking with a friend of mine, and he was telling me that they, um, based on the research, um, the first human to live to be 200 years old wow. has already been born. Really? They, they expect that humans will be able to live to 200 before the lifetime of everyone that's alive today, which I think is amazing. Wow, that's fabulous. 
I wonder how much longer each of us will have than say our parents had. Right. Well, the, the, the story I heard, this was probably 15 years ago now, was that if you could live to 2050, which we're still you know 29 years from, yeah. um, then there will be no question of you living to 100 years old. Okay. They think that technology will advance enough that you could probably get to 100. Now, in 2050, I will already be almost 80. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have to imagine that um, that's probably a guarantee anyway, maybe for me, hopefully. <laughs> um, today is my 45th birthday, by the way. Oh, I get to celebrate it with you. Happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, anyway, let's let's move on because I want to learn all about you. So um, the general way that I like to do this is if you were telling a story at a dinner party to some friends about like what your work history was or maybe a brief interview, uh, I'd love to hear where you got started, where you went to school, and kind of what path you took to get to where you are today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a very unusual career path. Um, I have to start by saying that I was interested in history since third grade. Okay. Um, when I wrote a very detailed history of the Habsburg emperors, <laughs> all wow. of them, and there were a lot. Yeah. Uh, it was a, I was uh, visiting my grandmother one, one summer, and she had a lot of data on this. At any rate, um, so I ended up getting my first PhD in history. I went to the University of Michigan, and my thesis was on 16th century Mexican social history. And I was working in a town of called Puebla de Los Angeles, which had a lot of very early 16th century data about the early settlers. It was one of the first places in Mexico that was settled. Um, at any rate, so I had all this data. And uh, while I was still getting my PhD, I needed to get a job. Uh, so I started teaching at Smith College. And so this kind of slowed down my PhD a little bit, but actually it turned out to be incredibly useful because Smith College had something called a five colleges program. And while I was teaching at the different places, uh, I met a really wonderful professor at Amherst College and he was working on 14th century um, history and very similar kind of demographics. And he had a student who was triple majoring in history physics and computer science. Wow. <laughs> and this kid had created uh, a lot of software for him in Lisp, which was a kind of fun to learn thing uh, at the time. And so he offered to share it with me. And it ended up, my husband was uh, spending the summer um, in England because he was working in British history. So I was kind of had lots of time on my hands. and. Uh, I worked with a student and then with other st another student at UMass on using this LISP code to actually modify it for my use. And in the course of this, I fell in love with computer science. <laughs> and I learned three other programming languages which were popular at the time, and I just spent my whole summer programming. And as it resulted, um, it really helped me with my dissertation, but I also decided, because uh, some friends said, but you're a history professor. If you're in computer science, you can make twice as much money. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, a, a little bit of an influence. So anyhow, I decided to go to Penn, where my husband ended up teaching, um, and get a master's degree in databases. But they had a wonderful new program that they had started, which combined natural language processing, linguistics, psychology, and philosophy. So all those departments were involved wow. in that. And I decided to get a PhD in NLP. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's what I did. And a friend of mine and I wrote a paper that was published in Language, which at the time was the biggest uh, linguistics magazine ever. And some people at uh, Bell Labs read it and were really excited because we were working on prosody and natural language processing. And they invited us up and eventually I got a job there after I got my PhD. And I was there for 18 years uh, working wow. at Bell Labs, yeah. But Bell Labs has had some amazing products come out of it too. Not, not just the technology, but the people. Yeah, and the things amazing. they invented too. It wasn't really very product oriented at the time, but I got that way as I stayed there. So we were working on text to speech synthesis for a long time there. Amazing. So, so you get to Bell Labs uh, mm -hmm. after writing this paper, and 
we, we still need to come full circle on this. So today you're back to being a professor. Yes. Um, so they asked me to start a new department there, an HCI department, which I didn't know anything about, but I was the closest person to it, they thought. Mm -hmm. And it was great. And we had a good time uh, for a number of years, but it got to be too bureaucratic. And a friend of mine, <laughs> I had just uh, attended a meeting where um, the guy who was heading our the research lab said, uh, we have decided that we can actually do research without getting any funding from AT&T. <laughs> and the rest of us were like, huh? <laughs> right. So um, a friend of mine that very afternoon called and said she was interested in finding somebody to work in her department at another university. And so I started, I decided maybe I'll start looking. And I ended up working at Columbia because my husband by then had gotten a business degree and he was working at Citicorp. So it was good for both of us. Yeah. So that's how, yeah. So then I've been at Columbia since 2002. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's another 19 years. I mean, you've had, you've had quite a career. I know it's been so much fun. <laughs> that's great. And it's interesting to me because you're not the first person that I've spoken with. And I, I have that background as well. Not nearly the educational background that you do. Uh, but my undergrad is in um, psychology as well. Mm, okay. Uh, as as a as a topic of, of interest for me, and so yeah, I, I've often thought about that. I want to get another PhD in psychology. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think you should. Uh, at some point, you'll have the record for the most PhDs, I think. But hopefully, <laughs> that's a, that's excellent. Uh, but my my psych degree also had me gravitate a lot towards uh, computing and research and uh, understanding how to how to do like I have a, a very good friend from high school uh, who's done a lot of really interesting research on mapping um, uh, human brains uh, mm -hmm. like computers. It's just fantastic. Uh, and human computer interface, that kind of stuff is, is really, oh, really it's fascinating. Yeah, well, that was our department, which I had for a long time. And that's how I learned about it, HCI. Yeah. And it kind of influenced what I wanted to do. Otherwise, you know, I want to learn about what people do, and be able to take that information and actually um, do some machine learning techniques that can actually simulate that or recognize it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're going to we're going to dig into a bunch of that here as, mm -hmm. as we head a little further into this conversation, but uh, man, I'm, I'm so glad I got an opportunity to meet you. This is really interesting. So uh, so Amazon Scholar is something that I introduced you as, and I know that you've been almost a year now as an Amazon Scholar. Yeah. Can you can you kind of share, you know, what kind of drew you into that and what being an Amazon Scholar means? Yeah, so I got into it originally because some of my friends were Amazon Scholars at Columbia, and they were really happy with it. And I'm not exactly sure how I got connected with Amazon, whether they did or I don't know. But anyhow, some people mm -hmm. from Amazon called me and said they'd really like to talk about this. And so they invited me out to Seattle and I spent a day just talking to lots of really interesting and exciting people. Wow. Uh, most of them were remote, <laughs> but, uh, as we all are now. Anyhow, uh, so then we had a lot of uh, follow-up conversations after that, and they were preparing some really exciting uh, multimodal um, projects that I was very interested in, and some of my friends were also going to be on those. And since I was going on sabbatical um, starting last July, um, I decided to just join. So I just joined part-time as an Amazon scholar. Cool. And so what what is what kind of involvement do you if you can share this, what kind of involvement do you have with Amazon? Like what is what does the scholar program mean to Amazon? What does it mean to you? Well, um, what they tell you to or they suggest that you do at the beginning is just to talk to lots of people and lots of different groups that are in areas you're in. And there's so many different groups in areas I'm interested in at Amazon. It's just stunning. Right. So I spent the first couple of months just talking to people from these different groups. And uh, I'm still talking to a number of them now, but uh, I started working um, initially on natural language turn-taking, which I've worked on before and I've been very interested in. Um, and now I'm also working on something else that I haven't worked on in many years, which is um, uh, doing dialogue act modeling from speech as well as text. And do you know what dialogue acts are? 
No. Please. Sort of. uh, so there are things like statement. Is, is what you said, a, I said a statement. Is it a yes, no question? Is oh. it a W? So it's very important for people like Alexa to actually be able to understand those. Right. And what I had been working on a long time ago was showing how it was very important to have the speech information as well as the text-based information to be able to understand what people were saying and what they wanted out of it, basically. Well, cool. So I, I know um, when we talk about areas of expertise, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you, you have focused a lot of your research and time on things like prosody and uh, inflection and rhythm of human speech, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, these are topics that were relatively new to me until I joined the Alexa team about five years ago. Uh -huh. um, you know, you grow up and you hear about words and parts and syllables, but I, I had never really given it a ton of thought beyond syllables that there are these, you know, phonemes and all the other pieces that, that fit together mm -hmm. to handle a lot of this. And uh, it, it's just, it's a really interesting concept that I wish more people understood because it, it really shapes a lot of our communication and how, how, we, how we talk, right? So I, I know uh, you mentioned the act identification and, and turn taking. Mm -hmm. um, can you, can you talk more about that project and kind of what you guys are doing with that? Well, with the turn taking, um, I'm not working so much on that now, except with the dialogue act identification. Um, so what we're trying to figure out is um, what is this dialogue act and what's the appropriate response to that dialogue act? And one thing that I've really been interested in and in talking to people about, <clears throat> sorry, is um, something called empathy. Yeah and empathetic responses, which is also something that, you know, is being discussed um, at Amazon, uh, which is wonderful. So an empathetic response, empathy means that if I want to be empathetic with the person I'm talking to, I understand their feelings. And if they have some problem, I try to help them with it. So, for example, this is uh, very important for things like healthcare, where people can, you know, maybe be a little bit reluctant about talking to something. So, if I am very sympathetic and empathetic, um, they're more likely to be able to tell me things that will be useful for me trying to help them. So, a lot of people are interested in healthcare, are really interested in empathy. But it's not just healthcare. I mean, empathy is it's extraordinarily important just if you want to have a good conversation. People will talk to you more, <laughs> they'll like you more, and they'll tend to come back and talk to you again if you can demonstrate empathy. Because, particularly in the time, this time of pandemic, a lot of people are either totally bored. They're unhappy, right. you know, and so they really need to have some empathetic conversations. And I think that could be very, very useful for. Um, I agree. And a, a, good, a good percentage of our audience are software developers, people that are building things for Alexa today. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of them just mentioned in the comments that like, this is one of the reasons that I think we, we continue to work on what we can provide developers when someone speaks to a device right now, they don't have anything for any kind of, sentiment analysis or empathy or any of that stuff. They All mm -hmm. they get is, hey, the user wants to know what the weather is or something like that. Right? That's, right. that's the, the extent of what they receive. Mm -hmm. um, and I think being able to, one, recognize, and then two, provide that information to the people that are building these systems uh, really can change the landscape of how we think about a lot of these interactions. Absolutely. No, I think it's really important. Um, one thing that I worked on a lot was something called entrainment. And this is uh, related to empathy. Um, you don't always uh, want to entrain it when you're being empathetic because entrainment means that you're actually talking like the other person is talking. And we've been working on this for many years, uh, doing research on this. Uh, like you use similar words, you use the same sort of intonation, you use the same sort of pitch range. Um, all these the same sort of speaking rate. Maybe you and I are yeah. joining to each other. With people's rhythms, uh, I, I would assume this also applies to things like uh, copying people's accents. That could be true. Um, we didn't look at copying people's accents too much, but actually other people have found that if two people talk together for even three minutes, 
one of them will assume the accent of the other person. <laughs> I, I have a very good friend. She was raised in Northeast Ohio. Uh -huh. and, and generally, the northern part of Ohio, the southern part of Michigan, is considered the neutral accent uh, in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and she moved to Charlotte, North Carolina uh -huh. 10 years ago. And she is 100% that southern girl uh, accent. Uh -huh. yeah. That's amazing to hear. Because uh, she certainly didn't grow up there, but she's more than adopted all of it. Yeah, it makes you just you know seem more like you're a member of the group. Mm -hmm. or a member of the community so yeah. and people do it not thinking about it really oh yeah no i don't think it was a conscious decision it no, just uh -uh. but it's interesting and what we found is that when you entrain to someone else uh, they're more likely to like you they're more likely to think that you're intelligent and you actually have better conversations and you if it's a task-oriented conversation you're more likely to get it done correctly and quickly so um, I, I would advise everybody, <laughs> think about in training. <laughs> I think I want to have a conversation with you every week. This is <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm going to pivot a little bit because I know that you are involved uh, pretty heavily with inner speech, yes. which is coming up here really short, really quickly, right here at the end of August. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, um, can you tell me a little bit about your role with inner speech, mm -hmm. um, kind of what you guys are hoping to accomplish at the conference this year? Well, uh, so I've been engaged with interspeech since the 1990s. Uh, I was actually um, running, I was the chair of ISCA, which runs interspeech, and I was on the board for a long time. So it's something that I've been engaged with forever. And what we've always, me and some friends, have uh, always tried to do is to make it more diverse uh, and inclusive. So now I'm part of the interspeech, well, I'm part of the organizing committee for this next interspeech, but I'm also on a diversity committee that's been spanning a number of years. And what we do is we have meetings, uh, diversity meetings at every interspeech conference. And we also had started, and me and a friend uh, started something in 2016. Uh, which was, we call it, the Young Female Researchers in Speech Workshop for Women. Nice. <laughs> it's for women undergraduates and master's students because we know, um, you know, as there are lots of women undergrads, but as you get into higher levels and particularly when you go on to PhD, there are fewer and fewer women. It's just true in all of our universities. Yeah. Who, are getting their PhDs. So anyhow, we have a day-long meeting. I guess ours will be day-long, although remote this year. And uh, we have talks with other um, women, uh, senior women give talks and organize meetings and we have lunches with people. And we just talk to students about what they can do, how we got, how we got on, into our career and what they might be thinking about doing if they're really interested in research. So it's been fabulous. We have it now every year. Um, oh, that's great. That's really good. And we're also uh, trying to, <laughs> a friend of mine and I um, decided a couple of years ago that, inter that Interspeech and ISCA didn't have enough balance in things like who was running, who was the program chair, um, who are the ISCA fellows, things like that. So now we keep, <laughs> we keep the statistics on all of this uh -huh. and it's gradually increasing. And it's important to keep the statistics on stuff like that because sometimes people don't realize, you know, you don't have enough women ISCA fellows. You don't have enough women program directors. So yeah. anyhow, it's worked very well and ISCA is really into diversity. I really appreciate them. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. So I, I have a 17 year old daughter who's, uh, evalu who's evaluating universities right now. Uh -huh. um, okay. She, she has had an affinity for computer science, uh, uh -huh. take, taking all the AP classes she can in high school. Uh huh. Um, isn't sure that that's necessarily what she wants to do, but she's good at it. I, my, mm -hmm. my thought was software development, computer science is something that's amazing to be able to fall back on, right? Mm -hmm. you can write code. 
uh, as you mentioned earlier, you can get paid pretty well to be able to do yes. that. Uh, so go change your dreams. And if those don't work out for some reason, then computer science is something to easily fall back on. A lot of people who come to Columbia as undergraduates don't know that they want to major in computer science because maybe their high school doesn't teach it. Right. But once they take one of our introductory courses, uh, we have a lot of uh, classes that are designed for people who are interested in multiple different areas besides computer science. So if she is interested in Columbia, have her contact me. I most certainly will. I like I like the direct recruiting. That's excellent. <laughs> um, I, I, I will definitely do that. Um, all right. So uh, to pivot again, let's talk a little bit about your research because there's a couple of things that have stood out to me that are really interesting that I would love to know more about. Mm -hmm. And that's some of the research you've done on things like deceptive speech and trusted speech. Mm -hmm. um, Tell me, how, like, how did you get started with those kinds of topics, and what have you? What are the big findings? You know, what's interesting is you get onto topics sometimes that you don't expect to. Yeah. So we were thinking when I moved to Columbia, some friends of mine that I knew from other organizations, we were thinking about doing some work together on emotional speech, and we submitted a proposal to NSF, um, really big proposal, and. While it was being uh, just, uh, evaluated, 9-11 occurred. Mm -hmm. And after 9-11, the Department of Homeland Security was created, as you may remember. And the DHS wanted to prevent similar attacks in the future. They felt that these people had gotten in by maybe fooling the immigration authorities, which they had. Um, so they wanted to develop better computational methods to help people, because people are worse than chance at detecting deception. All people, including political people, military people, police, unfortunately. This is well known in the, in the area. So anyhow, uh, they decided to create um, a project, a multimodal deception detection project. And we were supposed to do, they said, since we had been working interested in um, analyzing emotion and speech, they said, how about doing deception instead? And we thought, oh, that's cool. Never the, that. the, the modern lie detector. Yeah. And so then there were people also that were looking at deception in facial expression and also in gesture and other sorts of things. And so they had a large group. And we actually demonstrated that our mod, our, the machine learning models that we developed, uh, we collected data, um, people who were deceiving and telling the truth, and we developed machine learning models to distinguish between when they were lying and when they were telling the truth. And we could do much better than people could on the same data. Wow. So after that, um, after a while, the Homeland Security people had to spend their money on other areas. And so that the Air Force decided that they were very interested in trust, as you pointed out, trust and influence. And so um, we got into that program, which we're still in. And they wanted us not only to identify deception, but also what kind of speech do people trust? And so that we also have been able to um, identify. and. What this shows us is why people can't identify deception very well because they trust features that we have shown to be characteristic of lying. So these are mostly prosodic features, but they're also using some different lexical features. Yeah. So anyhow, we developed a game, an online game, which we're using with Mechanical Turk we're putting out. It's very called cool. Lie Catcher. And so if anyone is interested in this, they should uh, sign up for to be Turkers. But basically, um, first we wanted to just demonstrate or figure out whether more people than just the people we had in our lab were bad at detecting deception. And like Hatcher showed us that that was true. And now what we're doing is we're trying to train people to identify deception more accurately. So we give them uh, a question that one of our subjects was asked and the first answer the subject gave, and we asked them to say, is this truth or a lie? And we also give them a normal voice of that person, which we had also collected so they can compare that voice to the voice they hear. And if they make, if they make a mistake and say, 
it's a lie, but it's true, we tell them why. We give them training. And the same if they say that it's true and it's a lie, we give them training. And we're going to put out lots of tasks to do this and hopefully be able to get people, at least they have fun. It's a very fun game to play, I have to yeah. tell you. <laughs> so I'm sure our audience would be interested in giving this a try. If, if they want to find Lie Cat, where would they search? Or where can they find that? Um, they could search for um, deception detection. Um, I think that's the name of our, I should have gotten the name of, if they're interested, they can just contact me and I will tell them where it is. Right. But they can also just look for a lie capture. Well, a couple of the folks in the audience have already found like your Columbia professor page, which I'm sure has probably your email address on it. So expect a couple of emails. On yeah, that. that's fine. Okay. Uh, all right, that's great. So, so we've talked about deception and I know we talked about empathy uh, a bit earlier, um, some really interesting concepts, but what about something like charisma? Um, I have been accused of having that from time to time, um, but it's the thing that you know makes speakers attractive, like politicians and, and uh, business leaders. Uh, I probably could use some training in this area, I think, sometimes as well. But uh, I'd like to know what what are your findings around charisma? So we started on this. It was just a course project with three of my students in my course back in 2003. So we've been working on it forever. Um, and what we did then was to um, actually ask, this was before you could do crowdsourcing, and so we had to develop our own crowdsourcing me mechanism. And we put this out and we put um, like segments of speech and also um, they could, of course, understand what the person was saying. And we asked them to rate how charismatic this person was. And these persons were, at the time, this was a long time ago, uh, running for um, the Democratic candidacy for president. And so there weren't a whole lot of them, not as many as there were in our last election. Right. And only one was female, so it wasn't very balanced for gender. So anyhow, we got some really great results. And we tried the same thing. Uh, this was on people speaking English, but we tried the same thing on people speaking uh, Arabic because I had a student working with me who uh, could speak Arabic. And so he collected the data for us. And what was really interesting was um, Arabic speakers rated their uh, charisma using very similar characteristics. That is, when you compare the voices, they were very similar. Of course, they were speaking a different language. So we decided to have the Arabic raters rate the English speech. Oh. And the English raters rate the Arabic speech. Even if they didn't and necessarily know that language. They, well, neither one, none of them did. Right. <laughs> We're not sure about that. And so they rated the charisma in the same way. They pretty much had the same view of charisma. Wow. The features of the voices they rated as charismatic were very similar in both cases. It was really, we also had people from Sweden do the same thing on both of those and yeah. their ratings. So people, the, the thing to conclude about this is it's not what you say so much as how you say it. Yeah, that's interesting. I wouldn't have expected something like charisma to necessarily cross language barriers. That's, yeah. uh, that's an interesting finding. Yeah, I know. So, uh, but anyhow, there are people that train people in charisma. We have not done that yet, but it's, um, but it's, you know, for giving, if you want to give a, a pitch for your startup or something like that, uh, a lot of people want to get trained, as do politicians. Of course. Sure. So recently we did do the uh, people running for uh, the Democratic nomination <laughs> this past year. Uh, we haven't published that data yet, but um, needless to say, the person who won was not necessarily the most charismatic person rated, but he was rated very highly in the other features like confident and sure reliable, those sorts of things. It would be interesting to see, and this is probably a longer term effort. Yeah. It would be interesting to see if the measurements that you guys can come up with against those candidates could reliably predict the winner. Well, we thought so too. <laughs> In no case have we ever been able to predict the well, winner. So uh, um, yeah, that's, uh, one thing we did do though, cause we were interested in gender and obviously uh, whether people would read uh, rate women um, lower than men because there has been had been some work on that. So we did a study of charisma 
just using things like podcasts and things like that, courses. And actually, we found that it's not significantly different, but the women uh, were actually rated higher than the men. So oh, no. we were a little surprised, but it depends, I guess, on who you have, you know, who's actually. Talking. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is interesting. I, I mean, I, I feel like generally society tends to sway male anyway when you think about political, right? I mean, I know. Look at the. Well, how many male presidents in a row have we had now? Yeah, and uh, we just had a mayor election, and two females actually came in second and third, so that was good. And yeah, then, that's good. so maybe things are changing. It, it is progress, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, all right, so speaking of progress, mm -hmm. uh, you've been working in the field of speech and natural language processing for a while, uh -huh. uh, and I'm very thankful for that. Mm -hmm. Where where do you see these kinds of technologies going in the next five or 10 years? Mm, okay, um, so from my point of view, I think, um, well, certainly, uh, particularly since I've been at Amazon and talking to lots of people working on Alexa, I think there's a huge growing interest in dialogue systems. And I think maybe the Alexa Prize has been a good incentive for that. I don't know, but uh, um, I'm noticing a lot more people who are working in this area. And I think a lot more industries want to be able to do it well as well. It's not just Amazon, but it's lots of different um, industries. So I think that's one thing. Um, there's also a huge interest now in identifying bias in AI, mm -hmm. and that's definitely, you know, everybody is concerned with this. You can't even submit a paper anymore unless you explain why it's, um, you know, not biased in any way against any ethnic or gender group. Um, and also there's a lot of interest in doing speech and from the speech and NLP perspective for social good. I have a, a friend uh, who's also an Amazon scholar. Um, she's been working with people in this Columbia School of Social Work um, to identify the sense of loss and potential aggression in social media posts in Chicago. And they're helping the um, social workers there to identify when people are posting something that suggests that maybe an intervention might be useful for them or helpful. Wow. Yeah, no, it's, it's amazing work. Um, so anyhow, uh, the other thing, of course, is social media. Now it's huge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's so many corpora out there that people are collecting. So we're actually doing some work um, on uh, identifying disinformation in COVID-19 and climate change, or climate gate, as it is sometimes right. now. Right. <laughs> and, and this is really fabulous, interesting. And social media just gives you so much, such a rich source of data. Yeah, I mean, it's just volumes and volumes, and it never it never really ends, right? It's not a finite set of data. Unfortunately not. Right. <laughs> and what we actually, one of the interesting things we, we realized was, that you know, when COVID-19 started back in where whenever it did, like a, oh, almost a year ago, two years. At any rate, when it started, I guess it was last fall uh, that people. No, it was last spring. I remember uh, having to come back from the Netherlands very quickly because they were going to um, block people coming back from the. From yeah, Europe. I was actually in India at that same time. And oh, were, that must um, have been really hard. And got got out just in time, yeah. Yeah, so what we, the interesting thing that we realized was that at the time, things that were thought to be true about COVID-19 were not dem demonstrably false. So if somebody's posting something where they say, <laughs> you should drink bleach, maybe not, but you know, <laughs> something that maybe seemed a little bit more realistic, um, but now has been proven to be not very useful. Um, so some of those posts, while they're disinformation or misinformation, they're not malicious in any way. They're not intended to be sure. bad for it. So that's one thing that's interesting to see, that truth changes over time. And what people should believe changes. And I hope what people believe will be changing over time with respect to vaccination. Yeah, but I, I mean, I think, and I, you know, for those of us that have subscribed to the world of science, 
I mean, that's that's how it's supposed to work. There's some noise here. No, not really. Oh, no. okay. Um, but I mean, if you think about science, it scientists don't know the answer on day one. I they have their theories, um, but that needs to be tested with data and rigor oh. and things do change, right? I mean, for forever, they said, don't wear masks, and they said, do wear masks. And it was based on the data they had at the time. Um, and I think that there's a lot of our population that struggles with that. Well, they're experts, they should just know. Um, but, you know, COVID was not something any of us were anticipating or really prepared. Yeah, well, I knew this from my history days. What was true about something, you know, 14 centuries ago, <laughs> then people discover some new data and you right. realize, it's different. Yeah. Yeah, but that's just academics, and not everybody is into academics. All right. I hope more people will be. Uh, all right. So speaking of academics, this uh, <laughs> this is my last big question for you. Um, when you think about students that are trying to pursue a career in this field, for example, my daughter, it's my mm-hmm. daughter, here's her. Sure. What are the reasons that you would recommend for people to, you know, maybe pursue a career within academia? That's not something that I had ever considered. Um, I, my path was to be a psychologist until I found out what I could get paid to be a software developer. Um, but when, you know, when you think about pursuing research, what, what are the things that you tell students as, as you've uh, gone on in your career? Yeah, well, since I've been in both academia and the industry, I kind of know the reasons to go into both, to either one. Um, And so what I tell students who are interested in this is, if you're in academia, you can do whatever research you choose. You choose your own topics. As you can tell, (laughs) just not necessarily those that are of interest to industry, but who knows, I guess deception might be. Um, But anyhow, uh, you need to get funding to support those projects, and that's a challenge. But also you get to, and then you also, if you're a faculty member, you get to work with wonderful students. Um, But unfortunately, when they graduate, you have to find more wonderful students. When I was at Bell Labs, I would have a group that stayed together for years, and it was wonderful. So that's a difference. And in industry, um, you can keep working with the same people longer and longer if you want to, and if they're really you think they're really great. But you do need to put the company needs first, which I discovered at um, AT AT&T when they really wanted us to put out our TTS um, to make some profit for them. So that's what we ended up doing. And it was a lot of talking to the software developers and they say, well, why did you want to do this? It makes no sense. (laughs) (laughs) So anyhow, it was, but it was fine. So anyhow, um, my advice would be, you know, if you really think that you want to work in academics, I would uh, try to get as much research experience as you can. Actually, it's good for academics or industry because you can get internships if you've got some good research experience too. So there are a lot of programs in um, a group that I'm been involved with since 2009. It's called the CRAWP, Widening Participation, and they have wonderful programs for undergraduates and graduate students, which I've been involved in. And for undergraduates, they give you a chance to actually do research in the summer in a university other than your own. And the good thing about that is you get to find out what other universities are like, and you also get other people who can write you letters of recommendation for whatever you want to do later. Yes. So that's really good. Anyhow, so um, yeah, I think um, you should see what, because a lot of my students, you know, think they want to go into industry. And a lot of them, when they've done a lot of research, think they want to at least do research in the industry yep. or, um, or in academia. So I don't know. My advice would be you could try both of them. Really, people <laughs> go back and forth two years, and you do something else. You know. Right. But I think the key to all of that that you kind of mentioned is that it's it's about building a network. Um, that is true. You definitely need to build a network whenever you decide to, to get right. I mean, that's that's been something that's been really uh, evident to me in my career. Uh, I won't give you the, the long story, but uh, the, the short story is 
outside of my first couple of jobs, every job I've had since has been because of someone I worked with or because of my reputation. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like people say all the time, oh, I need to clean up my resume. I don't even know where my resume is. I haven't done that in, in a while. And that's, that's good for, that's been great for me. I know not everybody has that experience, but by building that network and showing, you know, your capabilities and your knowledge and your passion, um, it really goes a long way in, in furthering your career. And, and you get, uh, you get opportunities to talk with Julia Hirschberg about. <laughs> <laughs> well, very pleasant talking to you too, Jeff. Certainly. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today, Julia. This has been a really educational conver conversation. Right. Uh, you can guarantee that you are going to get an email from my daughter. So oh, okay. uh, don't, don't <laughs> worry about that. What's her name? Uh, her name is Riley. Riley. Right. Um, for the rest of you, though, um, I would if you want to know more about this kind of work, this kind of research, Amazon.Science is our website that covers all of these kinds of topics, covers all of our published papers and blog posts and articles uh, that we've been sharing uh, throughout the year. Uh, I know that you can also go to Interspeak 2021 that Julie is a part of, um, where you can see all of the accepted papers that were available uh, for this year's conference. Um, and hopefully this gives you a little bit of a feel for what some of the work that we're doing uh, in the Amazon science world. There's lots and lots of research and opportunity uh, and we're always looking for people to come join us and, and be a part of it. So what I have to wrap us up here, Julia, is a, uh, a quick video from our Amazon science folks okay. uh, titled Meet Our Alexa Scientists. So Julia, okay. stick around. Um, right. I'm going to show this video and then I'll come back and chat with you. Okay. My name is Ola Banji Shonibar. I am an applied scientist at Amazon. I work with the Pearl Language Understanding Service and Response Team within Alexa Speech. My name is Aparna and I'm a senior applied scientist in the Alexa Speech Recognition Team. Currently, I'm working on building better experiences for bilingual customers of Alexa, just like myself. My name is Venki. I'm an applied science manager in Alexa AI. Me and my team of scientists uh, work on different paralinguistic signals associated with voice. As we know, Alexa is used by many customers across languages, across age groups, with different types of voices. We make sure we understand everyone irrespective of their variance in their voice. Hey there, I'm Jaime Lorenzo. I'm an Applied Science Manager in the Alexa test to speech Research Team. I joined the team three years ago uh, with a task to improve the expressivity and naturalness of our synthetic voices, and this resulted in the release of the Emotional Capabilities for Alexa. Currently, I am working with many other teams trying to push forward the envelope of what we can do with our technology. I'm Kayoko. I'm a Senior Speech Scientist in the Texas Speech Team at Amazon. I joined Amazon five years ago and initially worked on the launch of Amazon's first Japanese text speech voice, in the poly service, followed by the launch of the Japanese Alexa. And more recently, I've worked on the launch of bilingual Alexa, making the American English Alexa voice speak Spanish. Buenos dias, mi gente. I get to work on problems that are not well defined. You will be expected to um, develop and deliver end-to-end -end solutions. You would work on problems that are unstructured. And then, depending on the level, uh, you might be expected to, um, to mentor a junior colleague as well. One of the things that anyone will notice when they work in Alexa AI is the amazing group of scientists and engineers that we have around here. So there's lots to learn. Over the last two years, I've learned quite a bit. It's helped me become a better scientist, a better thinker, and a better employee. We are constantly learning new things, so we are having to adapt and adopt new technologies. Not only that, we are keeping learning, we are keeping absorbing technologies from other fields, such as NLP or computer vision. There is always a chance to keep learning new things, so I'm never bored. Many of the problems that I've worked on did not have any prior research work on it, or very little of it. There are also problems on which there's plenty of research available, but many a times the work done on academic data sets doesn't really translate when we work on solving these problems for Alexa customers. I really enjoy the challenge of working on and solving these problems. And this is really what makes innovation at the heart of what we do at Alexa. Nowadays, more and more machine learning techniques are being applied across different domains. And in text speech we're using a lot of approaches developed outside of the speech domain, which means that we see a lot of researchers with completely different backgrounds joining us in TTS. The customers uh, they are placed at the forefront of every decision we make. And so, if there is any character or skill you think that would enable you to be customer obsessed, that's a plus one. Alexa is a fantastic place for anyone who wants to work on solving real-world practical problems 
with deep learning in the speech and natural language understanding space. There's plenty of opportunity to innovate and build state-of-the-art solutions for some of these problems. So Julia, I just want to say thank you again for being with us here today. This has been my pleasure, uh, and I hope we get to speak again soon. Okay, very good. All right, thank you to everyone for tuning in. Uh, we'll see you again very soon. Bye-bye.